Hello, and welcome to our first episode of Untold Stories of World War II, The Power of the Post Office. My name is Lauren. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. I would like to go ahead and start the program um, by handing the show over to Charles Epton from Siegel Auction Galleries. He's coming to us from New York. Lauren, thank you very much for having me, and thank you uh, very much to everyone who's tuning in. Uh, I'm very excited um, to be joining you all tonight to talk about uh, the power of the post office during World War II and to share um, some of these untold stories of World War II. Um, before I begin my, my slideshow, I'll just give you a little bit of um, information about myself, um, because the first thing I want to say is that while I am a history buff and love learning about World War II, um, my background is in stamp collecting. I'm a philatelist, uh, first and foremost. That's sort of the, the fancy technical term um, for stamp collectors. So if I, if I uh, slip up in any of my details about the war, I apologize. My focus uh, is, is, is uh, I'm going to try and uh, put it on the stamps and the way um, that, these, that these letters were carried. So with that out of the way, um, I, was, I, I was born to be a collector, uh, I think is the easiest way to say it. Uh, my family are all collectors. My father collects um, seats from old baseball stadiums, uh, amongst many other things. So growing up, it was always baseball cards, books, um, rocks and minerals and fossils. Uh, really anything that I could collect, I wanted to collect except for postage stamps. And I think there was sort of uh, a, a stigma, um, some sort of prejudice I had against postage stamps, um, that it was maybe not the most hip or uh, current or, um, yeah, you know, it wasn't really a young person's hobby. So I, I always sort of um, looked away from, from postage stamps until I got to college. And I was studying geology and history at the University of Southern California. And I was immersing myself in especially um, early 20th century American history, uh, you know, basically World Wars I through World War II. Um, and I, I, it dawned on me one day that postage stamps were not little scraps of paper uh, that you would try and line up in an album and, and collect one of each, but the postage stamps were living, breathing eyewitnesses to history. These were, um, they, you know, they were actually there. When you read about World War One or World War Two, uh, the, these stamps lived these these great historical moments, and we could learn stories through them. So uh, I was bitten by the bug. I went from zero to sixty uh, very nearly overnight. And I started trying to track down any old stamps or letters that I could and viewing them through an artistic, cultural, social, and historic lens. Um, the good news for me once I graduated college is that there's not many young people uh, who are getting into stamp collecting uh, in today's day and age. So um, job opportunities were uh, very quickly, um, you know, they opened themselves up for me. And I was able to uh, graduate from college and, and enter the postage stamp trade um, more or less seamlessly. So I've been doing this professionally at auction houses uh, for about eight years now. It's the only full-time job I've ever known. Uh, and I still get just as excited um, every day when I go into the office as I did when I first started collecting, because I'm always learning something new. I'm always seeing something that I've never seen before. And I think that this hobby is really fulfilling. And what, what I would like to try and convey tonight is that um, even if you don't consider yourself a, a stamp collector, I'm curious if, if anyone is a stamp collector, I'd love uh, for them to leave a comment. But even if you're not a traditional stamp collector, even if it's not something you've ever um, gone out of your way to pursue, I think that um, everyone can become a stamp collector. Everybody has it in them, even if they don't know it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight um, through the, the items I'd like to share. And then hopefully by the end of the talk, you might have a, a new view on stamp collecting, uh, a new appreciation for the hobby and how it can be used as a lens through which to view historical events. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen and begin my presentation. Um, can everyone see this? I'll wait for confirmation. Yep. Yes. Perfect. So um, with that out of the way, um, let's start by talking about sort of the, the, the star of tonight's presentation. I'm going to be talking about what are called the transport airmail stamps. These were stamps issued between 1941 and 1944. You can see the um, six stamps here in various colors and denominations. 
from six cents all the way up through 50 cents uh, were issued over the course of mid to late 1941. And then finally in 1944, there was a new eight cent airmail rate uh, that necessitated the new eight cent um, olive green stamp. So in the 1930s, as airmail was uh, starting to spread, airmail in the United States began in 1918. This is the first time the government uh, flew mail by airplane. But throughout the late teens and 20s, there was a lot of uncertainty. Airplanes were new technology. Um, people weren't certain whether they trusted putting their letter onto an airplane because there were planes going down. There were airmail pilots being killed and people didn't want their letters being lost, especially since airmail service uh, required extra postage. You had to indicate to the post office that you wanted your mail to be carried by airplane. Nowadays, if I mail a letter from New York to California, it's going to get on an airplane, um, you know, whether I like it or not. But in the 1930s in particular, um, you had to indicate, I want my mail to go by airplane. Uh, and you had to, again, pay the extra service for it. So the various airmail stamps that were issued in the 20s and 30s uh, were all different sizes and shapes. There were stamps for the Graf Zeppelin's flights in 1930. There were uh, stamps with a winged globe on them. There was a stamp with the Spirit of St. Louis on it. And by the late 30s, President Franklin Roosevelt, himself a stamp collector, wanted to standardize airmail postage stamps. He had done this for regular postage stamps a couple of years earlier in 1938. And he said, all of our airmail stamps need to look the same. They need to be standardized. We will color code them depending on denomination. Um, but in late 1940, he sent out the word to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing uh, that new airmail stamps would be designed. And, and by early 1941, this is the design that they had settled on. Now, um, what's really interesting, the other part of the equation is that as these stamps are being released in, in mid to late 1941, the U.S. is entering World War II. So our story really begins um, on Christmas Day, 1941, when Franklin Roosevelt announced a new postage rate of six cents per half ounce for overseas military personnel. So any um, uh, United States serviceman serving anywhere around the globe could send a letter back to the United States by airmail for six cents. This was viewed as a sort of Christmas gift for troops stationed overseas. And when I first read this, I was confused why um, a new postage rate would be viewed as a gift, especially since in World War I, soldiers were allowed to send mail home for free. So why Franklin Roosevelt's six cent rate um, uh, was such a big deal initially uh, kind of confused me until I remembered that at this time, international airmail rates varied from 10 cents to a dollar and 10 cents per half ounce, depending where uh, on the globe you were. So a lot of Caribbean and Central American nations had a 10 cent uh, airmail postage rate to the United States. But if you were on the other side of the planet, in the Philippines, in India, uh, many of the places where uh, you know young men and women from America were being sent, um, it may cost a dollar and 10 cents per half ounce. A half ounce letter is about two sheets of paper um, tucked into an envelope uh, for reference. So this six cent rate that Roosevelt announced uh, was actually a huge savings for soldiers and ensured that they would be able to communicate with their loved ones no matter where they were stationed. So um, for reference, here's a letter that we sent. I don't mean to jump ahead to the uh, end of the story um, at the beginning, but this is a letter that was sent home uh, at the end of the war from Tokyo to Pennsylvania. And you can see it's got the six cent airmail stamp on it paying that rate that Franklin Roosevelt provided for soldiers. A really interesting discussion about the stamp is what kind of plane is on it. Um, because, you know, I look at this, I, I, uh, I appreciate old aircraft, but I'm not a, an aviation enthusiast myself. And to me, this looks like a uh, you know, sort of generic plane from World War II. But when you look at it closely, you start to realize that it's not as um, you know, self-evident as, as one might think. This plane is actually an amalgamation of various aircraft that were being produced at the time. You can see here, this is a Douglas DC-3. The military variant, the C-47, looks much the same. And both the plane on the stamp and the DC-3 have this distinctive twin engine design. You can see it's got one engine um, on, on each side of the fuselage. Um, but look at the, the tail of the plane on the stamp. And it looks very much like the Lockheed Constellation. Now, the Constellation wouldn't enter production until 1943. 
Um, but I'm sure there were prototypes and things uh, that, that the designer of the stamp was aware of. Um, Cause you can see it's got almost an identical, um, you know, uh, triple tail fin, but the Lockheed Constellation has two engines on each wing rather than the one engine on each wing uh, on the postage stamp. So what did the government say about this? They said that the stamp represented a modern transport plane in flight. They were very vague about it, but researchers have speculated that they may have been vague intentionally because had they depicted a Douglas or a Lockheed plane on the stamp, it essentially would have been a free advertisement. And the government was contracting planes from numerous manufacturers, and uh, they, I think they, they um, played it safe and depicted a plane that no one was actually making so that they didn't irk uh, anyone they, they had a contract with. I also want to talk about this stamp by the numbers before I get into the actual letters that we're going to be discussing tonight. So here, once again, is the six cent uh, transport airmail. Um, this was released in 1941, like I said, and there were 4,746,527,700 of these stamps printed. So over 4.7 billion of them with a B. To put that into a bit of perspective, that is 34 stamps for every single American man, woman, and child in 1945. So this stamp was ubiquitous until airmail rates were lowered to five cents in 1946. So for about five years, this stamp is the workhorse of the American Postal Service. By comparison, this is the stamp's predecessor. This is the uh, 1938 six cent Eagle airmail. This was in use for about the three years leading up to the transport airmail. It was the highest print run of any airmail stamp in American history up until that point, And they printed 349 million of them, a huge number, but less than 10% of the six cent transport airmail. And then one last little thing for comparison, uh, I'm sure a couple of people uh, watching recognize this in, in 1991, the government started a series of um, commemorative souvenir sheets, uh, 50 years of, of each year of World War II. They, uh, they would depict 10 events from that year of the war. Uh, and a lot of people collected these when they came out each year. They only printed 15 million of these uh, souvenir sheets. And I can tell you, these things are still a dime a dozen. They printed more than uh, collectors could ever want or need uh, at 15 million. You compare that to the 4.7 billion of the transport airmail stamp, and you start to realize just how, uh, again, ubiquitous and widespread the use of this unassuming, humble little six cent stamp really was. So let's get into the untold stories. This is um, this is what I love. There's a special discipline of stamp collecting called postal history, which is when you look at the actual envelopes. We uh, in the hobby tend to call them covers. That's the the fancy word we use for envelopes for some reason. Uh, but when you look at the cover and when you take into account the stamps, the markings, the addressee, um, who it was sent from, anything you can suss out from a cover like this. Um, that's called postal history, and that's really uh, what I feel very passionate about in, in my job and in my own personal stamp collecting. So here we have a letter that was sent from Rockford, Illinois, on September 11th, 1943. This was addressed to Staff Sergeant Thomas D. Gilbert, who was with the 8th Air Force in England at this time. What his wife couldn't have known when she sent this letter is that uh, just four days later, on September 15th, uh, Sergeant Gilbert's plane was shot down and he was captured uh, by German forces. Now, if you look in the top left of this cover, you'll see the words missing in action. That was added when they couldn't find him. September 30th, um, they didn't know if he was captured. They didn't know if he'd perished. So they, they declared him missing in action. But what's really interesting is a couple of weeks later on November 12th, they changed his status to prisoner of war they knew there was no way for this letter to get to him as a POW. Uh, so they returned it to his wife in Rockford, Illinois. And the letter was actually never opened. It's still sealed to this day. Um, uh, she obviously held onto it as a memento of a very dark time in her life. But uh, the happy ending to the story is that he was released at the end of hostilities in May of 1945. And he returned home to his wife in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, I'm going to sort of work my way chronologically through these items. Uh, so you'll notice I jump between uh, both Europe and the Pacific, but I wanted to present them uh, in a chronological fashion over the course of the war. Um, this is a prisoner of war uh, letter sheet. 
the government actually pre-printed these letter sheets. If you can imagine this unfolded, um, it would have different panels for, for someone to write on. Um, and then you would fold it up. It had little gummed flaps that would seal it. And by providing these pre-printed prisoner of war letters, um, it standardized mail going to prisoner of war camps and it allowed the government to much more easily censor these things. Obviously, you don't want um, sensitive classified information getting in or out of POW camps. So this one was sent from Detroit, Michigan uh, to, a, to a young man named Barton Hare. This was sent by his mother uh, who lived in Detroit. Um, he was serving uh, in, in uh, the Pacific Theater in May of 1942 when he, uh, his unit surrendered uh, to, to the Japanese soldiers on the island of Corregidor. And he was held in the Philippines until being transferred to a POW camp called Houghton Camp, uh, which was in Manchukuo. Nowadays, it's Shenyang, China. Um, his mother, I, I, I found uh, family members in a, a message board online discussing how his mother tried to find him and would just address mail to the Philippines or to Japan in the hopes that it would get to him. Obviously, it didn't until um, she was able to um, uh, locate him in this POW camp. And even during the hostilities, the, the, different, um, uh, the different nations had agreements with each other on how to get mail uh, to and from POWs in the camp. So uh, another happy ending. Uh, he was released May 1946 uh, and returned home. So it took him a little while to get back to the States. But why I really wanted to highlight this one is the great thing about these um, POW letter sheets is that because the writing was done directly onto the sheet itself, it wasn't a separate letter. So the letter couldn't have been separated. Um, it couldn't have been lost. You've got all of the information um, directly attached to what was mailed. So here you can see what his mother wrote to him. Uh, it says, dear son, I guess you'll get a bunch of mail at one time. Your father died August, 1939. Aunt Lavinia died October, 1943. God bless you. Love mother. Um, I don't know if he'd been away from home uh, for a couple of years before the start of the war, but it's been five years since she's been able to get in touch with him. It takes her five years to be able to tell her son that his father died. And you can imagine having such limited space to convey a message to a loved one. You don't know if you're ever going to see them again. I think these uh, prisoner of war um, uh, letters are uh, really haunting and harrowing reminders of, of you know, the, the reality of war. This is one that maybe doesn't look like a whole lot uh, on its face, but it's actually one of the rarest World War II covers imaginable. Um, this was sent from a Sergeant Bob Kitajima, who was located at Army Post Office 953. Now, the, the uh, Army used Army Post Office numbers during World War II as a way of trying to conceal um, the location of various units. So a, an Army Post Office number was either linked to a physical location, as it was in this case with Hickam Field in Honolulu, or an Army Post Office may have been linked to a unit, and that post office would have traveled along with the unit um, you know, as, as they moved. So this was a way of trying to, you know, they didn't want to write their return address on a letter or they didn't want people sending mail to, um, you know, the address where, where a unit was stationed. So the army post office system was a way of trying to, um, uh, be a little bit clandestine. Now, what's really interesting about this, I did some research and, uh, Bob Kitajima was born in the United States in Oregon in 1910. Most Nisei soldiers during World War II served in the European theater of operations. Uh, this includes the famed 442nd Regiment, um, but there were very few Japanese American soldiers sent to the Pacific theater. There were fears that having Japanese Americans fight against Japan might lead to, um, you know, retribution and retaliation. Um, but a very few Nisei soldiers were sent to the Pacific as interpreters. Now, the more research I did on Sergeant Kitajima, uh, the more fascinated I became with his life. He served in not only Hawaii, but also Guam and Japan, uh, where he was on the atomic bomb survey team. And he visited uh, both Nagasaki and Hiroshima in the immediate aftermaths of the bombings uh, to serve as an interpreter, which I think is just um, uh, an incredible responsibility and an incredible service to his country. Um, he came back home after the war. He lived to the age of 85, passed away in 2005. And according to one researcher, there are only five known envelopes from Nisei soldiers serving in the Pacific 
during World War II, which gives you some sense of how uh, few of them there there actually were. So uh, again, this is a perfect instance of where uh, you know you learn the backstory behind the gentleman who sent this, and it just uh, you know takes what what otherwise looks like an ordinary envelope and elevates it to a a significance um, uh, you know on a global scale. Now, this one I love talking about, especially in the wake of the Oscars last weekend. This is an envelope uh, that was sent from Houston, Texas, to a Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Max F. Roy at box uh, 1663 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, if you saw this envelope, you would think that somebody uh, in the 40s must have just taken out a P.O. box, and that's where they wanted all of their mail address to. But the truth behind this is much, much more interesting. Um Box 1663 was one of several undercover post office boxes in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that was used to receive mail for Manhattan Project scientists. If, if they were worried about people, uh, you know, addressing mail to soldiers, they were really, really worried about mail being addressed to uh, Los Alamos because the Manhattan Project was uh, of a secrecy that the country had never experienced before. Um, and you couldn't just have people writing letters to Los Alamos National Laboratory. So what the government did is they took out a couple of post office boxes in Santa Fe, and they had all mail to the Manhattan Project addressed to these post office boxes so that government censors could receive it, open the mail, make sure there was no confidential information, and then it would be brought to the laboratory and distributed to its recipients. So Dr. Max Roy was an organic chemist who was attached to the Manhattan Project. And what's really interesting about him, after the war, he became the director of the Explosives Division uh, at Los Alamos and ended up living at Los Alamos uh, on base for the next 50 years. He lived there until he passed in the 1990s, and his home is actually being converted uh, into a museum, last I read. So uh, again, this is uh, another great envelope that looks um, looks like an ordinary letter, um, but when you know the history of Box 1663, and again, especially with Oppenheimer cleaning up, and I hope uh, you know attracting a lot of people uh, to learn more about World War II history, this is just a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful relic. I've got a few more for you here. Um, this is an envelope that was sent from Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, 1945, uh, which was not VJ Day. This was instead um, the day of Japan's formal surrender. And a letter such as this is not necessarily rare or valuable. Um, you've got uh, tons and tons of young men um, stationed aboard ships, uh, you know, towards the end of the war. Um, a lot of them are stamp collectors. A lot of them know stamp collectors back home. Um, so they would make souvenirs. They would get bored and they would make um, special cancellations or special uh, envelope caches like that VJ day design. Um, in order to commemorate where they were and what they were doing. So you see mail like this a lot. What's really special about this one, though, is what was inside. Now, I, I realize this um, drawing is not um, politically correct by today's standards, but there's there's one aspect of it that I really wanted to highlight. This was sent from a soldier to an 18-year-old friend of his back home in Ohio named Marcus Orr. And the soldier wrote, Marcus, if you still collect stamps, perhaps you could use this one. Now, my first thought is that he might be referring to the um, six cent airmail stamp on the envelope. Uh, but like I said at the beginning, there were 4.7 billion of them printed. I bet that Marcus uh, was was drowning in airmail stamps at this point. So I don't think that's what uh, the soldier was referring to. What I believe is that he had probably enclosed a Japanese postage stamp. You see this a lot where soldiers would um, uh, get a hold of postage stamps or paper money or coins and send it back home uh, to their loved ones or to their friends as a souvenir. So what's great about this to me is that not only is it a, a wonderful relic of World War II, but it ties in to the history of stamp collecting as well. This is a firsthand reference um, to stamp collecting at you know one of the one of the darkest moments in American history. Um, soldiers still found soldiers still found ways um, to use stamps to try and brighten someone's day, and I think that uh, really speaks to the power of philately throughout history. Uh, and this is the last piece I want to share with you guys, and it also happens to be um, uh, my favorite item that I'm going to share with you. This, once again, uh, what I love about stamp collecting is it's often the most unassuming items that um, uh, have the most most gravity and, and most importance to them. This is a letter that was sent from Thomas Haynes uh, with the office of the U.S. Chief of Counsel, um, APO for Army Post Office 403, was located in Germany at this time. 
And this was sent back home to a friend named Harry Little in Chicago, Illinois. Now, November 29th, 1945, we're after the war. Um, but I think a great hint to what is in this letter um, comes from the fact that November 25th, 1945, the same day, was the day that the hour-long John Ford film, Nazi Concentration in Prison Camps, was screened by the prosecution during the Nuremberg trials. The prosecution was a bit unprepared. Um, they needed uh, almost to stall a little bit. So they decided to screen this film that demonstrated the atrocities of the camps. And it was uh, a bit scandalous and shocking to show this sort of footage in, in a courtroom. Um, but this is what was going on the exact day that this letter was sent. And the fact that this envelope still has its original letter in it is what's really special. This is the full letter. And uh, I, I think this talk will be archived so you know people can go back and read this after. But um, basically what this is, uh, our writer was a court reporter at the Nuremberg trials. And he recounts in harrowing detail what it's like. He mentions uh, Goring and Hess by name. He puts you in the room. And I think the Nuremberg trials are one of these events that we all learn about in history class. And, um, uh, you know, we, we all, I, I, when I was in Germany a couple of years ago, I visited, uh, you know, the, the, the courtrooms. And it, it's one thing to, um, you know, read about it in a book or watch a movie about it. But when you read the the um, eyewitness account of someone who was in the room, it puts a whole new spin on, on just what was going on. So a couple of quotes I'd like to share. Um, he writes, some of the testimony made me feel as though I needed a good bath. I had heard the horrors before, of course, and I had accepted them. But hearing the people actually responsible for them tell of them added a new dimension to my understanding. I feel this same way again, through the uh, account being told in this letter, that it adds a new dimension to my understanding. We continue, the witness probably takes the cigarette offered him by the interrogator and then settles down to an amiable little chat about the thousands of people he has killed or the treatment of prisoners of war. Some of them even draw neat little diagrams and charts showing where their victims came from and where they died. There's an air of unreality about it. And then the paragraph that still gives me chills every single time that I read it. The most unnatural feeling comes though from consideration of the personalities of the witnesses. They don't look cruel. I imagine that most of them were kind to their children. A psychiatrist might well find in them traits of sadism or abnormality, but in you or I, if you or I met them under normal circumstances at a party, we in our naive fashion would probably put them down as rather average, well-mannered persons of fair intelligence. Yet they talk of 30,000, 60,000, 90,000 persons whom they have sent off to slave labor or to extermination camps, and they draw those nice little diagrams. I don't understand it, except that though it is hard to kill one person, it is easy to kill thousands. And I think that last sentence in particular is one of the most chilling things I've ever read. Uh, and again, puts a, a, a personal... Um, firsthand eyewitness spin on an event that we all know about. Again, you, you don't expect to learn anything new about the, the Nuremberg trials, especially through a hobby that is generally considered uh, as um, mundane or pedestrian as stamp collecting. And yet here, this is a letter I never would have laid my hands on um, if it weren't for stamp collecting. And this is the sort of thing that really, uh, I think, elevates stamp collecting uh, to be much more than just a hobby. Again, earlier tonight, I called it a lens through which to view history. And that's really how I feel about it. Um, you know, when I hold a letter or hold a stamp or hold um, uh, any of these, these postal artifacts, they're much more than the sum of the paper and the ink, uh, you know, that, that, that it was printed with. These are, um, these are eyewitness accounts to history. That's what keeps me so excited to go to the office every day. That's what keeps me um, so excited to keep, um, you know, trying to spread the word about stamp collecting and the, you know, trying to convince people um, stamp collecting maybe isn't what you think it is. I, I, you know, a lot of, whenever I tell people what I do for a living, uh, the thing I get most is, is people say, oh, my grandfather collected stamps. And I want to convince people that Philately, uh, it can be many things, but it's not necessarily your grandfather's hobby. It is something that is very tactile and tangible and real and alive. And, um, you know, that's that's the message I want to share with these untold stories of um, of World War II. So 
With that, I want to welcome any questions or comments. I want to uh, thank everyone again for tuning in, and I will turn it back over um, to Lauren. Uh, and and again, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed and, and maybe looks at stamp collecting uh, a little bit differently now. That's that's my main hope. All right, thank you, Charles, for your wonderful presentation. I know I for sure learned quite a bit uh, about the Postal Service and what was going on during that time period. Um, Right now is the time that we open up for our at-home audience to ask questions. Um, and as some of those might come in, uh, I'm going to ask a question to kick it off. Uh, so I noticed on one of the envelopes on the back, it had some initials, S-W-A-M-K. Do you know what that stands for? That's a great question. There's a lot of sort of cultural trends, uh, you know, even going back to the um, 17th and 18th centuries, you'll see things written on letters that maybe have um, little or no meaning today. Back in the 1700s, for example, if you sent a letter across the ocean, um, you would basically write like with God's luck on it, um, hoping that um, you know uh, your your letter would make it because ships were going down so much at that point. And, and these little letters, usually abbreviated in Latin, uh, mean nothing to us in the 21st century. So you ask about S W A M K. I can answer 80% of your question. Um, it was very common at the time, especially for um, you know uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives, uh, to write S-W-A-K, sealed with a kiss. Um, this was just a, a nice, cute little um, thing to add at the end. Um, there were variations to that. There was S-W-A-N-K, sealed with a nice kiss, sealed with a loving kiss. Um, and uh, I, I see someone suggested sealed with a massive kiss. My wife earlier tonight said maybe it was sealed with a million kisses. I don't know exactly. Maybe it was an inside joke that they had. Maybe it was something that only they knew. Um, but I know that at least four of the letters probably mean sealed with a kiss. And whatever that adjective is uh, with the M is um, uh, maybe that's a, a great mystery that's been lost uh, over the last you know 80 years. Okay. We had a comment come in um, from Stuart about how his dad's letters were from the U.S. Army Postal Service were marked as free. Uh, do you have any information on that? Yes. So, um, uh, so, so throughout, um, it's actually one of the great battles in the history of the American Post Office is um, who is able to send mail for free. Um, er, early on in the late 1700s, early 1800s, postmasters were allowed to send mail for free. Um, to this day, senators are allowed to send mail for free. Um, first ladies, even after they're widowed, um, even after their husband's out of office, are allowed to send mail for free. Um, but when you, um, uh, when you have the privilege to send mail for free, there's um, certainly the, the potential for abuse. And a lot of postmasters early on were um, fired for sending frivolous mail um, for free. Same with um, a lot of a lot of other government uh, officials. So like I said earlier, World War I, um, soldiers fighting in Europe were allowed to send mail for free beginning in late 1917. During World War II, that um, privilege was, was curtailed and limited um, to certain individuals um, if it was being sent um, to a, an army or navy official in the United States, or if you had achieved a certain rank. There were, there were um, various classes of mail that were allowed to be sent for free. That six cent rate was for your, um, you know, average GI writing home to his um, wife or mother. But yes, there, there is a lot of mail. I, I would say 95% um, of mail sent during World War II was either sent free of charge or with the six cent airmail stamp. Um, it's really difficult to, and these were the stamps that were um, you know, kept on hand at, at Army and Navy post offices. So um, finding mail that's not sent free and not franked with the um, the six cent airmail stamp is is quite challenging. Those were the the two main methods of sending mail. But the free privilege was um, uh, it was reserved for for certain people. Okay, we have another question from Caleb. Uh, how did the mail get to the Navy ships out in the ocean? Do you have any information about that process? Yeah, so that's a great that's a great question because obviously um, even submarines as well, you'd have people who were um, you know in the middle of the ocean for weeks or months at a time, and um, typically uh, the, the the answer is you couldn't send mail uh, until you either um, met up with a ship that was was headed to port or if your ship uh, itself docked. Um, if you were in the middle of the Pacific or in the middle of the Atlantic, 
you were uh, you were kind of on your own until you were um, able to connect with other people. So soldiers would uh, sailors would go, um, you know, months sometimes. They you'll see it where they would write letters each day or each couple of days and then hang on to them um, until they were able to mail them all at once. So they'll all be postmarked the same day, but they will have been written uh, over the course of weeks. So that's a fantastic question, and the the main answer is. Um, they couldn't really. They were they were essentially um, cut off from from the rest of the world. Okay, we have one last question. I think that we're going to take, and it's a question about the the letters uh, that were viewed today. The, um, asking where they came from. So they are not part of the museum's collection. They are part of the auction houses. Yes. So um, these letters uh, are, are are from a very experienced collector. Um, I'm in the process of researching them, documenting them, scanning them, and then they will come up for auction um, in the near future. But the great thing about um, uh, about World War II mail, A, there's there's so much of it. There's there's probably millions of these letters out there. Um, uh, many of them are in uh, museum collections. I, I know um, uh, you guys have, have a wonderful collection. The Smithsonian um, has a great collection of World War II era mail. And, um, you know, with, uh, having so much of this out there, um, there's, there's a lot to go around. There's a lot in museums. There's a lot in private collectors' hands. There's a lot of collectors who work closely with museums or they publish articles um, or they make their available, uh, they, they make their material available um, to researchers. I know college professors who have used, um, you know, privately owned letters from the Pony Express to write their dissertation. Um, so, so these letters in particular are coming up through Siegel auctions um, in the near future. But um, you know, there's a lot of museums with great holdings. A lot of those museums are digitizing their collections. Um, you know, myself as an auctioneer, I feel a responsibility to digitize all of this and to make scans of the letters um, freely available. Um, so, so it's sort of an all of the above approach when it comes to studying World War II mail. You've got private collections, institutional collections, and everything in between. Plus, I see a lot of people in the comments, it's wonderful, um, you know, that they've got their father or grandfather's mail. And I think that, you know, when this stuff can remain in the family, that's that's ideal as well. All right. So, like I said, that was going to be our last question. I apologize, I apologize to our at-home audience that we've run out of time. Uh, but before I let everybody go, I want to say thank you again for spending part of your evening with us. And I want to remind you that next week we have our um, normal daytime webinar on March 20th at 1 p.m. And it will be entitled Spies of the Pacific, uh, the Claire Phillips story. So I'm very excited for that one. It's going to be very interesting. Again, I want to say thank you to everybody and to Charles for uh, his lovely presentation. And for everybody, uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you very much, everyone.